Hello, and welcome to the overview regarding the Fairfax County Public Schools Restraint and Seclusion Policy. Today's overview will include provisions for parent notifications, debrief conferences, and policy requirements. The purpose of this FCPS policy is to establish procedures regarding physical restraint and seclusion. In rare cases where there is an imminent risk of serious physical harm to self or others and to ensure the safety of all students and staff. FCPS will use positive behavior interventions and support strategies to reduce and prevent the need for the use of physical restraint and seclusion. Our FCPS policy, which was voted on and approved by our school board, either meets or exceeds the Virginia Department of Education's requirements for this policy. Let's take some time and go over key definitions. The first one, physical restraint. Physical restraint is defined as a personal restriction that immobilizes or reduces the ability of a student to move freely. Physical restraint does not include briefly holding a student to calm or comfort the student, holding a student's hand or arm to escort the student safely from one area to another, the use of incidental, minor, or reasonable physical contact or other actions designed to maintain order and control. Seclusion is the involuntary confinement of a student alone in a room from which the student is physically prevented from leaving, provided that no such room or space is locked. Seclusion does not represent timeout, in-school suspension, detention, student requested breaks in a different location in the room or in a separate room. It does not represent removal of a student for a short period of time from the room or a separate area of the room to provide the student with an opportunity to regain self-control so long as the student is in a setting from which the student is not physically prevented from leaving. Seclusion does not recommend a removal of a student for a disruptive behavior from a classroom by a teacher. And lastly, seclusion does not represent confinement of a student alone in a room or area from which a student is physically prevented from leaving during the investigation and questioning of the student by school personnel regarding the student's knowledge of or participation in events constituting a violation of the Code of Student Conduct, such as a physical altercation or an incident involving drugs or weapons. Serious physical harm means bodily injury that involves a substantial risk of death extreme physical pain, protracted and obvious disfigurement, protracted loss or impairment of the function of a bodily member, organ, or mental faculty. For this policy, serious physical harm is synonymous to a serious bodily injury. Last on our key definitions is imminent risk. Imminent is threat exists when the person's situation appears to pose a clear and immediate threat of serious violence towards others that requires containment and action to protect identified or identifiable targets. For this policy, imminent risk is synonymous to imminent threat. Fairfax County Public Schools prohibits the use of seclusion except at the Burke School, Key Center, and Kilmer Center. FCPS shall also have a division-wide prohibition of seclusion on or before the beginning of the 2022-23 school year. FCP prohibits the use of mechanical restraints. However, the term mechanical restraints does not include the devices implemented by trained school personnel or used by a student that have been prescribed by an appropriate medical or related service professional and are used with parent rental consent and for the specific approval purposes for which such devices were designed. FCPS prohibits the use of pharmacological restraints, aversive stimuli, use of a restraint or seclusion in any manner that restricts a student's breathing or harms the student. Prohibits the use of physical restraint as a form of punishment, discipline, retaliation, convenience, or to prevent property destruction. 
FCPS prohibits the use of corporal punishment, the use of seclusion rooms or freestanding free units not meeting the standards, use of restraint when medically or psychologically contradicted as stated in a documentation provided to FCPS by the IEP or 504 team, school professionals, or by a licensed physician, psychologist, or other qualified health professional under the scope of the professional's authority. SCPS prohibits the use of prone and supine restraints. Note prone restraint is completely prohibited in the state of Virginia, and supine is where FCPS exceeds in our policy by prohibiting supine restraint. The use of physical restraint or seclusion, again, seclusion is only permissible at Burke School, He Center, and Kilmer Center. Physical restraint and seclusion is only permitted when other interventions are or would be in the reasonable judgment of the particular school personnel, ineffective, and only for the five reasons as outlined in accordance with the Virginia Department of Edu Education regulations. These five reasons include, number one, prevent a student from inflicting serious physical harm or injury to self or others. Two, quell a disturbance or remove a student from the scene of a disturbance in which such student's behavior or damage to property threatens serious physical harm or injury to persons. Unless a student's damage to property creates an imminent risk of serious physical harm or the injury to the student or others, the damage of property does not itself indicate an imminent risk of serious physical harm or injury and shall not be the justification for the restraint or seclusion of a student. Number three, defend self or others from serious physical harm or injury. Four, obtain possession of controlled substances or paraphernalia which are upon the person of the student or within the student's control. And number five, obtain possession of weapons or other dangerous objects that are upon the person of the student or within the student's control. The use of physical restraint and seclusion shall be discontinued as soon as the imminent risk of serious physical harm or injury to self or others presented by the emergency situation has dissipated. School personnel are not required to attempt to implement a least restrictive intervention prior to the use of physical restraint or seclusion when, in their reasonable judgment of the school personnel in an emergency situation, a less restrictive intervention would be ineffective. For example, if a student was running into a busy street. School resource officers shall not be involved in the physical restraint or seclusion of a student initiated by school staff unless there is an imminent danger of serious physical harm to self or others. Now, let's unpack the use of physical restraint by looking at scenarios and determining if a physical restraint would be appropriate based on the behaviors listed. Scenario one, a student exhibits the following behaviors, refuses to wear a mask, argues, shouts at staff, climbs under a desk, verbalizes self-harm statements, lays down and places a chair over her own throat, kicks peer in the shin, uses a pair of scissors, pushing it onto their own stomach. Do you believe these triggers meet the criteria for the use of physical restraint? The answer would be no for the use of physical restraint. Now, do the behaviors listed need intervention from staff? Absolutely. Staff can safely remove the scissors and the chair using an object removal and peeling techniques that they would have learned in professional crisis management or MANT training. Once the item is removed, then the staff can safely implement de-escalation strategies for student safety. Scenario two. A student exhibits the following behaviors, pushes another student to the floor, which resulted in the student who was pushed on the fall floor to fall, scrape their knee, and begin to cry. The, then the student curses and verbally threatens the classroom teacher, pushes the teacher repeatedly in the stomach, 
and then escalates even further and pinches the teacher's arm, which then the teacher's arm begins to bleed. Do you believe these triggers meet the criteria for the use of a physical restraint? Actually, let's before take another look before we unpack this further at our two definitions of serious physical harm and imminent risk. Remember, serious physical harm means bodily injury that involves a substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain, where imminent risk is a clear and immediate threat of serious violence. So when we go back to our scenario, looking at the behaviors described, do those meet the criteria for a physical restraint based on our definitions? The answer would be no for physical restraint. However, staff would want to intervene and implement, for example, other strategies such as or may possibly a room clear, blocking and redirecting, redirecting, so that way we can safely manage and support the injured student and teacher as well as de-escalate the student in crisis. Scenario three, a student exhibits the following behaviors. They pick up an electric pencil sharpener and hit a classmate in the head continuously. The classmate began to bleed significantly from the head. The teacher was able to remove the pencil sharpener. However, when the pencil sharpener was removed, the student continuously with a closed fist hit the classmate and teacher. Do you believe these triggers meet the criteria for the use of physical restraint? And the answer would be yes. When staff attempted a less restrictive interaction to remove the pencil sharpener, the student then began to continuously um, punch and hit the student and scratch the teacher. Um, so for those reasons, that would meet the criteria to implement a physical restraint, as such as for our two reasons. Number one, preventing a student from inflicting serious physical harm or injury to self or others, and defending self or others from serious physical harm or injury. Now we're going to move into the notification and reporting of our new policy. As soon as practical, but no later than the day of incident, a staff member involved shall report the incident of physical restraint or seclusion and the use of any physical, um, I'm sorry, and the use of any related first aid to the school principal or designee. The school principal or designee or other school personnel shall contact the parent regarding the incident and any related first aid. Forms of contact include in-person or phone communication or a communication that's been authorized by the parent. For example, text messages, leaving a voicemail, or sending an email. As soon as practical, but no later than the day of the incident, the employee involved in the incident or other school personnel, as may be designated by the principal, shall complete a written incident report. That form is in our electronic forms cabinet, and it's labeled use of form, use of physical restraint or seclusion incident documentation. Then they're going to provide the principal or designee the written incident report, and they're going to provide the parent with a copy of the incident report. On the incident report, these are the items that are included. The student's name, age, gender, grade, ethnicity, and special education status as applicable. The location of the incident, the date, time, and total duration of the incident, including documentation of the beginning and ending time of each application of physical restraint or seclusion. The date of the report, the name of the person completing the report, the school personnel involved in the incident, their roles in the use of physical restraint or seclusion, and their completion of the division's training program. Description of the incident, including the antecedent, resolution, and the process of return of the student to its educational setting if appropriate. A detailed description of the physical restraint or seclusion method used. The student's behavior that justified the use of physical restraint or seclusion. Description of prior events and circumstances prompting the student's behavior to the extent known. A least restrictive interventions attempted prior to the use of the physical restraint or seclusion. 
and an explanation if no such intervention, interventions were employed. Whether the student has an IEP, a Section 504 plan, behavior intervention plan, or any other plan. If a student, staff member, or other individual sustained bodily injury, the date and time of the nurse or response personnel notification and the treatment administered, if any, date, time, and method of parental notification of the incident as required by this section, and the date, time, method of the staff debriefing. As soon as practical, but no later than two school days of the incident, the principal or designee will have a staff debrief with all involved to discuss whether the use of restraint or seclusion was implemented in compliance with the FCPS policy, how to prevent or reduce the future need of physical restraint or seclusion. When uh, our staff brief is, is happening, these are some components to consider. Discussing those circumstances, which are the antecedents leading up to the incident, the incident itself, discuss the least restrictive and most restrictive interventions used and were the most restrictive interventions needed. From the information gained, discuss the changes, if any, that should be uh, made and discuss if the team needs any additional support, such as consulting with your behavior intervention teachers, your ABA coach, your clinical staff, psychologists, etc. As soon as practical, but no later than two school days of the incident or upon the student's return to school, as appropriate, depending on the student's age and developmental level, the principal or designee shall review the incident with the student to discuss the details of the incident, an effort to assist the student and school personnel in identifying patterns of behavior, triggers or antecedents, alternative positive behaviors or coping skills, that a student may utilize to prevent or reduce behaviors that may result in the application of a physical restraint or seclusion and impact of restraint or seclusion on the student to provide support and or identify the need for and facilitate the provision of additional social emotional supports, for example, such as meeting with your counselor, social worker, case manager, if applicable as appropriate. As soon as possible, but no later than the end of the following school day, dependent on access to the student. The student will conference with a trusted school personnel. The student should choose the trusted adult. However, if that is not possible due to age or developmental level, school staff may choose among team members and or consult with a parent or guardian regarding the most suitable staff person for conferencing. The staff who conferences with the student may consult with the clinical staff or support staff to explore further resources as needed. If the student declines to engage in this conference, the student's request will be honored. The student debriefing conference, components of the student debrief to consider, again, are students' age and developmental level, when conferencing with that trusted school personnel, do we need to consult with the parent to identify trusted personnel? Think about the crisis cycle and where the student is and what supports might be needed each way, part of the cycle. Individualized for student, so thinking about what accommodations or modifications might be needed for this debrief. And additional resources to consider. Again, consulting with our applied behavior analysis, coach, behavior intervention services, or intervention and prevention teams. Also, we can help to develop and individualize the student debrief process if needed. Following an incident of restraint or seclusion, school staff will provide the student's parent or guardian with the resources and offer them an opportunity to participate in a follow-up conference. This will be coordinated through an administrator, teacher, counselor, counselor, or clinician and staff have support from the Employee Assistance Program, if needed. In the initial development and subsequent review of the, 
in the initial development and subsequent review and revision of the student's IEP or se Section 504 plan, the student's IEP or 504 team shall consider whether the student displays behaviors that are likely to result in the use of physical restraint or seclusion. If so, they should consider a functional behavior assessment, a new or revised behavior intervention plan, new or revised IEP goals, or an, and any additional evaluations or re-evaluations if needed. Within 10 school days following the first school day in a single school year in which an incident of physical restraint or a seclusion has occurred, the student's IEP or 504 team shall consider, among other things, the need for a functional behavior assessment, a new or revised behavior intervention plan, new or revised IEP goals, and any additional evaluations or re-evaluations. Now, if a student does not have an IEP or 504 plan, then the team might consider a referral to local screening for a gen general education student. Trainings for our policy. First one, de-escalation level one, which is understanding the regulations governing the use of restraint and seclusion. That is FCPS policy require that school personnel receive training on skills related to positive behavior support, conflict prevention, de-escalation, and crisis response, including follow-up support and social emotional strategy support for students, staff, and families. This training is located on my PDE in video modules and can be found either by typing in de-escalation level one or understanding the regulations governing the use of restraint and seclusion, or my PDE. Second, we have de-escalation level two, our advanced training. In Fairfax County Public Schools, that would either be our man or professional crisis management training. That's for at least one administrator per school building and for school personnel assigned to work with any student whose IEP or Section 5014 determines the student is likely to be physically restrained or secluded and receive this advanced training. MAN training is provided from the Behavior Intervention Services team and Professional Crisis Management is from the ABA coach team. Um, both of those teams should have contacted you about scheduling these trainings. Annual reporting and review. The principal or designee shall submit a copy of the incident report, which is our use of physical restraint or seclusion incident documentation form, and you're going to email that to crisisprevention at fcps.edu. This new email address supersedes the former process of emailing or ponying a copy of the form to the Director of Office of Special Education Instruction. In addition, you must document each instance of restraint or seclusion in CIS. <clears throat> so now we're going to take a moment and go dive a little bit deeper and look at this new form and what it would look like to fill it out. This form, again, like I was saying, it can be found in the electronic forms cabinet and in addition is also linked from the due process and eligibility intranet page. When completing the form, the first step we're going to either check if was it a physical restraint or was it a seclusion. Again, seclusion only being for Burke, Key, and Kilmer Center. Then you're going to fill out the student's demographic information, name, date of birth, grade, gender, ethnicity, etc. The date of the incident, the beginning and end time, duration, <clears throat> um, who was completed by, the position, and then the staff members performing the physical restraint or seclusion and what was their role. Let's take an example and look at what that would look like. So if the staff were MANT trained, here's what that might look like. So if the, the name, Jane Doe, the position, the teacher, yes, they were trained in MANT. And what was their role? Their role was a one-person side body hug. This language comes directly from the MANT training. A PCM example could be in the situation. So our, our first teacher, 
Jane Doe was trained and their role in the physical restraint and seclusion was the left side of a two person standing vertical immobilization. Whereas our second person, RIA, was also trained and on the right side of a two person standing vertical immobilization. In this section, you will indicate by checking all the less restrictive interventions used prior to the use of physical restraint or seclusion. You may select more than one if applicable. If the less restrictive intervention utilized is not listed, check the box other and then describe. If no less restrictive intervention was utilized, select the box here saying that there was none and then describe what that would look like. In section two, this is where you are going to select one of the five reasons outlined in accordance with the VDOE regulations which triggered the use of physical restraint or seclusion. Then you're going to provide a detailed description of the student's behavior. When providing this description, remember to describe the behavior objectively. What that means is, so if you took a picture of it, what did you see? So for example, instead of saying a student punched staff member, you would say the student with a closed fist punched the staff six times in the arm. Number three, you're going to provide a detailed description objectively, including the antecedent, which is what happened right before the behavior, the behavior occurred, the resolution and the process and the return up to the educational setting. Let's take a look at an example of what one of those would look like. So take a minute and read this example. In the example that you just read, you will find the antecedents, for example, the transitions to English, a demand was placed, you saw a resolution, the student then sat, was sitting in a desk, low-level demands, de-escalation breathing techniques, and you also found the process of return, which was 10 minutes of success and other students returning. Section four, number four provides a detailed description of the physical restraint or seclusion and the method used. For example, the staff member working with the student implemented a single Sunday stroll followed by a one-arm wraparound procedure for 20 seconds. From the one-arm wraparound, when the student demonstrated three seconds of calm, staff faded to a Sunday stroll followed by a wrist tricep back to an independent walk procedure. So this is how we were able to describe the physical restraint and it was step by step using the language of either PCM or MAN. Number five, this is where you're going to mark did anyone sustain bodily injury? Marking yes or no. And if it's a yes, you are going to then describe what that looked like. Now on our form are section six and seven where the staff and student conference. As per the policy, we must identify the method. You will mark the box indicating team meeting for staff and student conference for the student unless for some other reason that is not the case and then you would mark other and describe. If you do not have the staff or student debrief the day of the incident, you would just document on the date time in progress. Um, and the reason why we're doing that is because we have two days to do the staff debrief and student conference, but the form needs to go home on the first day. So that being said, you're going to want to send the form home indicating in progress, but then once the staff debrief or student conference occurs, you're going to take the uh, in progress off, mark the date, and then resend 
both to the parent and email crisis prevention again, indicating the form has been completed. Then we have the next notification of the incident. We're going to just mark the date, time, staff initials for when the school program administrator was notified, when the parent or guardian was notified, indicating how they were notified. If there's another, you can check other, and then there'll be a box where you can type it in. When did you uh, send a copy of the incident documentation to crisis prevention, and when did you send the copy of it home to the parent or guardian? Crisis prevention is the email, crisisprevention at fcps.edu. Any questions? If so, here's your contact information. So questions regarding specifically professional crisis management, you can email Kelly Lobo. For behavior intervention services, which would be for MANT, there's Lori Creighton. Due process and eligibility, procedurally, that would be myself, Brad Bartis Savage. And any questions from intervention and prevention would be directed to Deb Scott. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's optional crisis prevention and policy office hours that will be available on Mondays from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Um, if you don't have a copy of this presentation, you can also find a link from the due process and eligibility internet page. Thank you so much and have a great day.